Okay. We are in uh, Psalm 22 in our quiet time. Um, we had one of those interesting breaks yesterday. They stopped before a paragraph. They stopped after we started the next paragraph, just one verse, and then so that we were supposed to start after the paragraph today. Um, and it goes to the end of that paragraph, that section in in the passage today. Uh, but also I'll back up just a verse to keep it in the paragraph. Uh, Psalm 22, starting at verse 11, and we read through verse 21. Um, it's one of those things that sometimes in, in reading through the scriptures, especially if you're reading just a chunk, you know, a smaller portion rather than a larger portion, and you don't have the whole context, uh, sometimes you're reading along and say, oh, okay, so uh, what am I supposed to get out of that? You know, what what's the thing? And um, just a real quick, let me tell you how I do it. One thing is, what I do is I sit and I read the passage that I'm reading for the day, we're reading for the day, and then I go back over and I more or less copy it. Sometimes I do a little paraphrasing with it or rewording a little bit uh, just to try to make sure I kind of got the feel for it. It makes me stop at least a little bit and question, well, how can you reword that and still make it say the same thing? And so then I write it all out. Um, and usually in the midst of reading it and writing it back out, there's usually uh, something that kind of steps up and says, hello, look at me. Uh, some phrase or word or something that catches my attention. And um, so I make, that's kind of a mental note, and sometimes I may mark it as I'm writing it uh, so that I, if nothing else kind of pulls together, I'll go back and look at that. And, um, I, and I, read through the, I read through it, and then I wrote it all out, and I still wasn't quite sure. There were a couple of things that caught my attention, and, and so I kind of went in a way that I think it's an application is what I made is more than a than an insight from the text itself. But uh, hopefully it'll. I think I'm consistent. I've got some New Testament backing for my things here. So, let's start Psalm 22, starting at verse 11 through verse 21. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you, capital Y-O-U, according to the translators, lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look at, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen you answer me. Yeah. Now, did you did you see some really significant things in there? There's some New Testament quotes in there, referring to Jesus Christ on the cross and that whole thing. So Psalm 22 is a pretty powerful psalm that way. Um, and so I kind of well, that maybe I should gravitate towards that. But here's what I here's what I kind of went towards. Um, bulls. And oxen, and lions, and dogs. Oh my! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, those were how David described his enemies, and in a in a prophetic sense, kind of how Jesus was surrounded by bulls and lion, bulls and oxen and lions and dogs. And if you stop and think about it from the standpoint of wild animals, if you're if you're kind of wandering around and you've got wild dogs after you, or wild dogs surrounding you, you would be in a little bit of trouble. If you're dealing, having to deal with a bull, I haven't dealt with. We had a when I was a little kid, there was a bull across the street from our house, and I don't know that it. If there really was, I don't know that I ever saw it, but I was told there was a bull there, 
And so you, 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 if the ball went over the fence, oh, we were scared to go over and get it. And um, because you know you don't want a bull charging it, and an oxen probably would fall in that category. And then the, and the lions, of course. Well, I don't know about you, but when I think of lions, when I see lions in scriptures, I always think about our that enemy goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, that Satan is that enemy. But as I thought about this, I, the phrase that came to my mind was unreasoning animals. Bulls and oxen and lions and dogs are looked upon as unreasoning animals. Uh, it's a phrase that Peter uses in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, talking about false teachers being, they corrupt the scriptures, they pervert them, and they are, they are like unreasoning animals. They don't think, they don't rationalize, they don't reason, and maybe that's an insult to animals, uh, but to, to some animals, yes. Your to your dog, yeah. Uh, Jude uses the same phrase in Jude verse 10. Uh, then we go to Philippians 3, 2, and, and Paul says to the Philippians, he says, beware of the dogs. Paul in Acts 20, counseling the Ephesian elders, he says, uh, he says from without and from within yourselves, there are going to be ravenous wolves that come in after I leave, not sparing the flock. And so you get this picture of some pretty dangerous creatures not always dangerous, but lions, I would think, would be pretty dangerous, and wolves. Uh, dogs, you can hopefully tame, unless they're those wild and in a pack, then that's another story. Um, animals, people who don't reason, teachers who don't reason. And so that got me thinking along the line of false teachers and, and false teaching. Uh, so here's what I wrote for the day. I wrote, false teachers, false teaching create unreasoning, unreasonable people, whether it's within the Christian culture of, of a, of a cult-like thing within Christianity uh, that takes something out of balance. And, and you try, if you've ever tried to reason with somebody who's out of balance and, and teaching something that's in error, <laughs> around and around and around you go, and, and there's no reasoning with them, what seem, what makes perfectly good sense, and you can show it from Scripture, is not accepted. Um, and so, anytime we buy into that, and not not just within Christian circles, when we look at those outside of the Christian realm of things, I would say most everyone would look at ISIS and say they are unreasonable, and they are unreasoning. Uh, we won't necessarily throw everybody under the bus in that, but there are those that obviously are like that. Um, it creates false teaching, false teachers. They end up creating unreasoning and unreasonable people. Uh, people who don't function as humans are supposed to. That's supposed to be the hallmark of humanity, that we have that ability to reason, to be reasonable, to talk things out, to solve problems, to work things through, to come to an understanding, to learn. Um, and because of sin in the world and because of false teaching and we buy into these ideas, it gets all messed up. Um, and when they become like this, they become dangerous to the truth. They become dangerous to those who uh, believe and follow the truth and proclaim the truth. Uh, the Lord in this circumstance is our only hope. Even as David was saying about his enemies, describing his enemies, whether it was going to be on the philosophical level or the power le political level or Jesus with the Pharisees and the priests and the Romans, it could be physical, it could be intellectual, it could be whatever it is, but they become very dangerous and maybe even to the point of death, even to the point of attacking and killing, uh, which is probably the extreme. Um, the Lord is our only hope in this case. We aren't going to usually reason our way out of it, and we are usually going to win by arguing. Um, his work, His power, He's the one who can open their eyes. He's the one who can open their hearts. He's the one who can help them to hear. He's the one who grants repentance. Uh, yes, we should tell the truth, and we should try to proclaim it as well as we can, but realize that you know, it's not my arguing that's going to do it. It's not my convincing. I, getting louder is not going to make them hear. 
unless they're hard of hearing, I guess. <laughs> but usually yelling is, doesn't, isn't going to accomplish it. Maybe you get their attention that way. Um, our only weapons are the Word of God, the truth, and prayer. We pray and we ask God to grant them repentance. We pray and we ask God to open their eyes. Uh, Jay Sidlow, not Jay Sidlow Baxter, uh, Richard Baxter, you guys read that book in um, Pastoral Ministry? Yeah, uh, the, what's it called? Reformed. The Reformed Pastor. And uh, I had a quote from that that I had written down years ago, and I still think of it off and on, and I'll paraphrase it because it's a longer one, but basically it says, how can we expect the people that we preach to on a Sunday morning to repent if we haven't bothered to ask God to grant them repentance? If we haven't prayed for them, if we haven't asked God to work in their hearts, so he was putting it back, hey, don't, don't just assume because you're telling it that it's going to work. You've got to put some prayer into this as well. Um, so we throw in that prayer. We will not argue people into the kingdom. Uh, perhaps it will take martyrdom, that physical death to where, and even then they may not, but, but when Stephen was martyred, that became something that was probably used in Paul's life, Saul's life. We, we kind of think about it because he, he mentions it. Um, got some people's attention for sure. But there's also that other martyrdom aspect. Martyrdom is just mean being a witness. We uh, do it to the idea of being killed. Um, but we can be a witness, a martyr, in the sense of Romans 12, 1 and 2, that we would lay down our lives as living sacrifices. When we live the life, when we proclaim the truth, when we live the truth, that makes that message even more powerful. That's our defense. That's our hope. So let me encourage you, when you run into dogs and lions and bulls and oxen, stubbornness and, and the hard-headedness and people who aren't going to listen, just live it, proclaim it anyway, pray for them, and, uh, and watch your back. <laughs> I guess that's the way it works. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word to us, that even in the times when it seems as if it's a little odd, Lord, uh, you speak to our hearts. You show us the truth. You reinforce the things that you've taught us before. And so, Lord, as we come tonight to uh, the book of Numbers and the book of Deuteronomy, Lord, may the things that we already have heard become even more so clear in our thinking. And may the, maybe the things that we didn't remember or didn't know or whatever was there, Lord, may that newness and that freshness of it uh, drive it deep into our hearts. And Lord, may we learn more than just the outline and more than just the information. Lord, may we have your, your spirit speak to our hearts this night. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, we can do your questions. We have the question and answer thing up. Uh, I'm assuming Rob's got it up at Yale, Pastor Rob and Pastor Sandy. I don't know if Pastor Sandy has that up, but if you guys do have that option, you can do it. I guess, uh, Pastor Sandy, or if you don't have it, you could text my cell phone number and, <laughs> and do it that way because uh, Nathan will pick it up. So Nathan will check your questions and interrupt me uh, when it needs to be done. We also might be having, do we have three on or just two? Just two, okay. We were thinking we might get uh, Dilly Bible Church on tonight. Uh, if, if not, that's okay. So welcome to uh, our Washington friends. Um, let me encourage you to do this. Have your Bible open to the book of Numbers and be ready just to kind of scan along as we move through there because we'll we'll probably stop and, and visit a couple of things here and there, and that way you've already got it, or at least if you aren't to that page, you're going to be, you're going to be pretty close. Um, if we wanted to look at an alternative title for the book of Numbers, we might use the, the phrase interrupted conquest. Uh, that's really what is at the heart of the book of Numbers. You would think that it would be about Numbers, but it's not really about numbers. Uh, you have a couple of chapters about it, but uh, that's a little dis, uh, a little con di confusing for us at times. Uh, in English, we call it the Book of Numbers. It's translated from the Greek Septuagint uh, that gives us that title. 
Um, the book received its name from the two separate numberings uh, that they did that took place within this, this book. Um, don't remember the chapters right off the top of my head, but it, but there was one chapter where they numbered all of the warriors, all those who could go to battle, and then later on they had another. So out of 30, was it 30 chapters, there's only two that are connected to a list of names and numbers, a list of numbers. So it gets a bad reputation. You know, you can't judge a book by its title sometimes uh, and by the cover of it. Um, the Hebrew word, um, 36 chapters, oh, okay. Oh, there are, each sentence just takes up only one chapter, okay. Uh, the Hebrew word, uh, Bam Midbar, uh, means in the wilderness, which is another great title for the book of Numbers. And how do you suppose that the Hebrews came to name this the book in the wilderness? If you look at Hebrews chapter, I mean Hebrews, if you look at Numbers chapter 1, verse 1, then the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai. So they, as we've seen already in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus, there's something in that first phrase, and I don't know if in Hebrew, in the wilderness is the first phrase. It very well could be. In the wilderness, God spoke to Moses, you know. Um, so that would, be, that would be a good alternate title. And those alternate titles are things that you want to make sure that you're aware of for the quizzes that come up in the final test, because uh, those will certainly be there. Uh, you'll you'll want to know about those two numberings and what they were for. The two numberings were to find out how many fighting men they had that could go to war, because uh, they were getting ready to go take the land. Um, Numbers, tells, Numbers is the book that tells us what happened during the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, which wasn't intended to be 40 years. Uh, just a quick recap of what we've already looked at in, in Genesis. Uh, Genesis sets forth the, the relation um, with the covenant God, the, the plan that God had in the midst of all, both as the creator of the universe as well as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we get the creation, and then we focus in on Abraham and his family. Then we go to Exodus, uh, relates the narrative of how God redeemed his people from their slavery in Egypt. Uh, he's pictured as entering into a covenant again with his people, whom he has purchased as his prized possession. The, the covenant is there again and again and again and again. And it gets established and renewed and renewed and renewed. And here in Exodus, it was renewed again with his people when he brought them out. Leviticus deals with the question of how men are to approach the covenant God, outlines the sacrifice and the forms of worship, uh, dealing primarily with the Levites and their responsibilities. Um, if you could sum it up in, in some, I would say God is holy. Uh, w another way to say God is holy is God is clean or God is pure. Uh, I like to use the word other. God is other. <laughs> He's other than what we are. And the idea of cleanliness is seen primarily in the idea of physical cleanness in the book of Leviticus. Wash your hands and wash your clothes and wash that and wash the other and, and make sure you don't contaminate something. And if you do, then you've got to go through the ritual and the ceremony so that you don't get everybody else contaminated. Um, good idea. Great idea. If, if uh, it was working in Africa like that, the Ebola virus wouldn't get passed around. Um, but it's not just about physical cleanness. That physical cleanness is supposed to represent spiritual cleanliness, moral cleanness in our lives. That we would, we would just as we would want to stay away from germs and want to use some germicide and some antibacterial stuff everywhere, we would want to use that in our spiritual life to stay away from sin would be the lesson that we want to take from that. And then here in Numbers, um, very little historical stuff in the book of Leviticus. A couple of stories here and there. Um, Numbers picks up where Exodus le leaves off. So we come to the end of Genesis, and it's, it's, it's a cliffhanger. It leaves us with Israel and Egypt, and we don't know what's going on. And then we pick it up in Exodus, and we carry it in, 
and then Leviticus, they're 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 at the mountain. They've received the stuff, and now you get the little break, the little parenthetical thing of Leviticus. Now we go back from Numbers. We're picking back up where we left off. Uh, Numbers is written at the close of the wilderness wanderings. Not a, it wasn't kind of a, I don't know that it was a travelogue that he maybe he had a diary, but it was put together at the end when it was all done. Uh, it not only tells us about what happened, it tells us about the recipients of the book. Who was this book written for? The, the new generation that was coming in, because they were the ones who either weren't born yet or had only lived part of that time, and they needed to know what had happened and why they were in the situation they were in, what the circumstances were, how they got there, Hopefully so, that they wouldn't do it again. You know, those who refuse to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. Uh, that's, a, that's a true statement. Uh, so this new generation, we're talking about the old generation that died in the wilderness, and now uh, Moses challenges this new generation uh, to not make the same mistakes. There, um, it's more than just history. It's their history. It's their family history. It, it affects them directly because, you know, you ever wonder, well, how did we end up, how did I ever end up in this place? You usually, you know, sometimes maybe that's where you started and that's where you still stay. Uh, other times you find out that your family, I found out at least part of it that uh, in tracing back my, my grandfather Richardson's family heritage, that side of the family, we go back to Kentucky, and uh, I, it was probably, I think it goes back to somebody who fought in the Revolutionary War who got land in Kentucky, and then eventually they headed further and further west. Well, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing. It doesn't affect me directly. It's not a big thing from that standpoint, but in this case with the Book of Numbers, it, it's immediate, and it's right now. It's, it's just the previous generation, and you're born in the wilderness. And all that you've known is, okay, the pillar's there and the fire's there and it moves and we move and we've had some of these events and these scary things and these frightening things um, and these hard times. What, what is life all about? Why are we here? Well, there's a reason for it. And uh, that's what Numbers is here to tell us about. Um, it's always, there's always a need to teach the old truths to a new generation. More than a need. <laughs> How, it, it's an absolute, I mean, an absolute necessity. That's the same thing as a need. If we, if we don't teach the old truths to the new generation, to the next generation, it doesn't carry on. Um, it was Louis Palau. I don't know that he coined this phrase, but he put a video together. You know, God has no grandchildren. And uh, you've heard often maybe that we have, uh, we have a lost generation. We, people will look at, at society and say, oh, you know, it's going to hell in a handbasket. We have a lost generation. And I think our contention could be, no, we have the product of a lost generation. And maybe it would probably be more likely to say we have the product of the product of a lost generation. Um, in, believe it or not, within village missions, there are small rural communities where uh, our village missionaries have found people for three and four generations who have never been to church, never been involved in church, have no interest in church. Um, that's not, that's, how could that be in America? We often think of ourselves as a Christian nation, but uh, if we don't pass it on, if we don't teach it to the next generation, it doesn't get taught. And then you get the book of Judges, yes, <laughs> which we'll get to. Um, let's set the scene here. Israel has spent about a year camped at Mount Sinai, getting the Constitution together, getting their act together, learning the ropes, um, and now we're getting ready to leave and head, uh, head out. Uh, Numbers was written by Moses, um, probably about 1406 B.C. at Moab. How accurate is that? Um, is that the, yeah, 1406. I, I, it's as good a guess as any. It's in the ballpark. Um, I, I, don't, I can't dispute it and say, oh, no, you were wrong, you were off. 
somebody will, I'm sure. Uh, but it gives you it gives you the area, the general area, and that's important to see because later on, when we get into Deuteronomy and we look at uh, some uh, some information that came out of that same era, that kind of gives us an insight and a picture of Deuteronomy uh, that'll help us. So, if you've got kind of in your mind 14, 1400 BC, give or take, then See, the big argument is when did they leave Egypt, the date of the Exodus? As long as you're in the ballpark, right? That, that's, what we, that's what we have to go on. Um, I put a chart. Oh, did, oh, don't, did, did, there it is. There's a little bit of an outline, uh, and I put it in your notes. Um, some events and the, the time that's involved in this, we have, you, you see the Mount Sinai, uh, from Mount Sinai to Kadesh, from Kadesh to Moab, and then on the plains of Moab. Uh, pretty broad categories broken up into those chapters. Uh, what happened in the first section was they were getting ready to go, uh, which was a big ordeal. Much bigger than you getting ready to go anywhere, um, for sure. Uh, at, from Sinai to Kadesh, we have the tests. The, that's, that's the turning point of the book at Kadesh Barnea. Uh, and then from Kadesh to Moab, the, that's their wanderings, and then the end of the journey. Uh, you got the old generation and then the new generation. Uh, the first part took several weeks. This middle section was about 38 years, give or take. So there was a year at least there, and then 38 years or so, uh, and then several months on the plain of Moab as they're getting ready to go in and conquer the land. And that's when we have Deuteronomy, the whole Deuteronomy thing that takes place. Um, I, I, like, I liked this idea of the mountains. Uh, Mount Sinai. Of course, we know what happened at Mount Sinai. That was the giving of the law, the, the covenant established there. Mount Hor uh, shows up here at the end, just as a hint, it shows up at the end of the 38 years. We have a couple of people... Uh, that are buried on Mount Hor, Hor. Uh, Aaron and Miriam are both buried there. And then we come to Mount Nebo, and Mount Nebo is significant because that's where Moses was able to see the Promised Land. And then is he buried on Mount Nebo? I don't know. Scripture tells us nobody knows because God took care of it. And so you aren't going to find it. Uh, anyway, sometimes having a chart to kind of lay out the the breaks in what you're reading uh, helps helps us. And so I would encourage you if you if sometimes you're struggling with something like that, just get a get one of the charts out or the outlines and just kind of look at the outline so you see it gives you an idea. This section goes together, and this section because if you're just running through, sometimes you stumble over it and you don't even know you've changed something. Uh, it may not be quite as clear. So, Numbers chapter 1, uh, we have the census. How many are available to go to war, is the question. Uh, they counted males who were 20 years old and up. To how old? Doesn't say. Um, hmm? Who was ever able to go out? If you can hold a sword and you can walk and, and make it. Yeah. For this amount of time with the Levites, yeah. there was the, the question was wondering if they had the same kind of restriction for the military, for the war warriors, as they did for the Levites, uh, which was a I, I think it was you could only serve till you were 30, 40, 50, 30 to 50, I think, or something. I, it was it was a fairly short window, um, relatively speaking, but um, I, it doesn't it doesn't give us that parameter. And so I'm guessing it's anybody who's able-bodied. If you're able and you're willing, you know, you can, if you're going to, you can beg out sitting on my back, you know, <laughs> or just bend over and hit, limp a little bit if you're older. Uh, and maybe you get out of it, I don't know. The tribe of Levi was not numbered because they were the priestly tribe. They weren't going to be involved in the warfare, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing to think about, you know. The Levites weren't going to be involved in, in war. 
And there are those in, in the Christian community who would say, because we're priests of God, because we're followers of Christ, we object to going to war on, on a personal basis, where they would say, I don't want to go to war because I'm a pacifist from that standpoint. It uh, doesn't mean that that the government can't fight war and wage war. They should, obviously. Um, but maybe that's part of the some of the pacifist thinking to say, you know, a lot of times it says they don't like war and they don't want to put their life in danger. But from the standpoint of the Levites who were priests, not going to war was uh, kind of an interesting thing. Um, the Levites took the place of the firstborn for Israel. We had uh, Shirley ask about that before class the other day. What's up with the firstborn? Um, God says the firstborn are mine. The firstborn of animals are mine. Those are the ones you sacrifice. The first fruits of the field are mine. Uh, that's what you give to me. Uh, your, your tithes and offering are the first fruits of your labor. The things that you you take that first and give it to him. Uh, there was a whole uh, festival, a whole feast designed around the idea of taking the very first things that when you see the crops and there's enough there to get something, you get it and you bring it to God to say, look, God, you're the one who's provided this for us. We're giving you the first part to show that commitment to you. Um, if you didn't redeem the firstborn, then the firstborn had to die with that animal. Either you had to sacrifice, if you weren't going to sacrifice the firstborn, then you had to sacrifice another animal that was clean and that was good. Uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't get away with that. It had to be redeemed. And so the Levites, uh, if we, it's kind of another interesting thing with Egypt killing all the males and then the firstborn male in every Egyptian household dying in judgment. And so here this firstborn thing comes up again. Um, these are mine. And so you have to, you have to somehow redeem them. So how are they redeemed? They're redeemed by the Levites stepping in and taking that spot. And they're the ones dedicated to God. Um, they were numbered separately. Uh, and it was, I thought it was an interesting thing. They go through and they count all of the Levites and they, just so they know the number for the redemption. And they... How, how they can do work the formula to make sure that they've got enough. Um, logistics of the march. Have you thought about that? Up to, up to two, maybe two, three million people all camping together. And, uh, okay, Moses says, let's go this way. Actually, Moses didn't say it. The pillar would get up and move, pillar of fire, the pillar of uh, cloud. And when, the, when it would rise... And then it would take off. Well, how the Lord would take off and lead them. Well, how it wasn't that quick because you imagine the response. You're minding your own business because you have no idea how long you're there at a given time. You're there until it's time to go. And you wake up one morning and, oh, I guess we're going. And so now you start packing up and loading up and putting down the tent and loading things up and getting the kids together and putting out your fire. And, and then, then everybody just starts going. Not to mention having to take down the tabernacle. Yeah. So, so the idea that we see in Scripture is that the, the pillar of cloud would go up and that would, okay, start packing up because now we're getting ready to go. And, and I thought it was, it's, it's just like the Lord that he is patient and he waits, gives us time to get things together and, you know, reasonable in that regard. Uh, extremely challenging op operation. Uh, then you throw in the animals, the livestock that you got to try to herd up. All their worldly possessions. Um, there was a fixed camping order. Uh, there was a fixed camping order arranged around the uh, tabernacle and a fixed order of departure. Uh, some people will see symbolism. It, let, let's look at that. Um, there's, you, you have this chart in your notes, and there's a couple of charts. There's one, in I think, in both of our books, in Benoit and in uh, Nelson's. They have, uh, this is how it's kind of laid out. It looks much neater than I'm sure that it was. and I'm sure it was orderly where they were, but you can imagine it's not a single line of tribe. You know, those people are scattered everywhere. Uh, you have um, uh, the leading tribes camped uh, at points of the compass. Uh, and, and um, 
the tabernacle being there in the middle of it, uh, there's a total, it gives you the total of everybody in that tribe that they had counted. I don't know if that's the total for their fighting men. I don't, I don't know. I don't remember the numbers there. Somebody look in Numbers 1 and you can tell me uh, if Judah has 74,600 fighting men. Okay, so that's the fighting men. That's the number of fighting men. And the, and the way they formulate this is they say for every man that's ready to go to war, he's probably got a wife. And then there's you factor in some kids in the midst of that, and so you come up with a good large number of people. Um, do you see symbolism there? There are people who will see symbolism in that arrangement. They, you would see a cross. Actually, it's probably more of a plus sign than a cross. You know, whichever way you want to look at it. Uh, do you see, you can see crosses everywhere. And you get the crosses that are the X's. And you get the crosses that are like the, the T thing. And you get the crosses that are just the plus signs. You know, the red cross is more of a plus sign. Uh, but we use it as something crossing over the other, whether it's a times table or a plus or an X or a T. Um, I don't know that we need to be overly vigilant and make a big deal about seeing that type of thing everywhere. Um, is it interesting? Yeah, it's interesting. There's probably a greater significance, a greater symbolism in the tabernacle, which has the more more of a of a cross-like what we would think of the cross of Christ, uh, the layout with the the tables on either side and the incense and the entryway. You know, you could probably see more of a cross-like thing there. Um, basically, it was their camping arrangement. So here we go. Here's how it was laid out. On the north side, Dan and Asher and Naphtali. Um, and with each of these groups on each side were sons of Levi. Uh, not all the Levites were the priests. The, they each, the Levites had their own within their families, they had their own responsibilities. Uh, sons of Merai were in the north, and the south was Reuben and Simeon. Dan was the leader there, Reuben, Judah, and Ephraim. They were the, the lead ones. Those are the people who led out in that group. So Judah would leave first, and then Issachar would follow them, and Zebulun, and then what would go next would be, I forget if it was north or south. Uh, one of the other tribes was south, and then the tabernacle would go, and then north would go, and then west would go. And that's how, they, so you get an orderly arrangement. Not everybody's rushing the gate to try, nobody, everybody's not cramming through the doors for the sale. They're waiting an orderly arrangement for the whole thing. And there's trumpets that sound, and, you know, some people would look at the trumpet, the last trumpet, and, well, that's when you're ready to move out. Um, uh, it could be. Um, interesting, Koath um, was uh, they they came they were with the South group and the Koathites. You remember what their responsibility was uh, as Levites? In your reading, it had to do with the tabernacle. They carried all the stuff of the tabernacle. Yeah, they didn't pack anything up. They didn't touch anything of the tabernacle. They carried it on poles. I heard a, heard a sermon when I was in Bible school. Linda heard it too. I don't know if she remembers it. Um, holy things on holy shoulders about the Kohathites. That, that they would they would put, they would it'd all get ready. They'd walk up, put it on their shoulders, lift it up, and start walking and carry the stuff. Sometimes it was in wagons. Some of the stuff was in wagons, but some of it was just carried on shoulders. Um, that was their job. That was the priestly duty. Not very glamorous, is it? You know, we, we use the symbol of somebody hoeing a row in our in our poster for Servants Bible School. Our symbol, you know, not very glamorous to hoe that row, but it's work that has to be done, and and it's significant work when you're bearing those things that are sacred and holy, those things that are in, in should be in our eyes valuable, things of great value. They don't have monetary value, but they have value. 
uh, it represents where God dwells with us. So um, then Judah and Issachar would, would head out and Ephraim and the last part um, going after that. Um, the map on, on page 71 of Benoit has um, a, a chart that might be helpful. We don't need to look at it now. Uh, oh, here's that thing we were just, I was just speculating about. The ark with Moses and Aaron, Judah and his tribes, Gershon and Merai, Reuben and tribes. Um, and there at the very end, that's where I wanted to get to this one. The mixed multitude. Do you remember reading about them when you were reading through Exodus and um, Numbers? Uh, they're there, and you kind of forget about them once in a while. So who is this mixed multitude? Um, who could it be? Obviously they aren't Jews, or if they are, they are perhaps mixed race Jews, Jews and Egyptians, Jewish Egyptians, or you know, you've got other peoples that lived in Egypt that were subjugated that maybe they intermarried, and so you've got half Jew and half something else. It could be some of that. It could be that there were Egyptians in that group. It was a mixed bag of things, people who weren't Jewish or were part Jewish, I guess, maybe. It could be Egyptians. It could be people from other cultures that had joined in with them. And some would speculate that maybe they, it was people they just wanted out of Dodge and the, and the Israel was going, we're going to jump on their coattails and follow them. Uh, but I have a feeling that the mixed multitude was probably more uh, from what we see in the New Testament. We, in the New Testament we see uh, God-fearing Gentiles. Those who have tired and wearied of the idolatry and they they start hanging around the Jews because the Jews don't have idols. And they talk about the one true God. And, and they gravitate to that and they start saying, this is something to believe in. This is something, I've tried all that other stuff and it doesn't work. And so, but they're Gentiles and sometimes they would become proselytes and become Jewish. They'd have the circumcision and go through the, whatever the process was to, to become Jewish. But there were a good number of God-fearing Gentiles who hung around synagogues, and Paul came and preached the good news, and the good news included the fact that the Gentiles could be a part of this kingdom and could know salvation in Jesus Christ, and they thought that was the greatest thing. And that's what, part of what got Paul in trouble, because he let the Gentiles in without making them Jews first. Uh, but here, they were traveling along, and I, this is my personal opinion, I don't know that I can fight it to the death and wouldn't fight it to the death, but I think that the mixed multitude was was probably uh, the least likely to be carrying the idols. That's just my guess. Uh, certainly I'm sure they did. Israel had their own. They had their own. We'll get to, to them taking care of that later. Um, in chapter 5, well, 1 through 9, we deal with uh, instructing the people about their responsibilities about uh, the laws, additional laws are prescribed, and uh, they were reminded to be clean because dwelt, God dwelt among them. Uh, give a hoot. Don't pollute. Well, don't, don't mess things up. Does it, does it amaze you at people just throwing stuff out? I was down at the, at the parking lot at the... Um, by the bridge the other day, we were putting up a sign for, this is another thing, putting up signs for weddings and garage sales and then not taking them down. Anyway, I, I was there putting a sign up for our garage sale, and I, and I was there in the parking lot, and I'm looking, and somebody had just taken a bag of trash from their car and not just set the bag of trash, they just dumped it, and it was all scattered over. And I don't get it. After, after the marathon here on 4th of July, when Linda and I are walking down the road, there's just stuff all along the side of the road. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you got pockets? You know, hold, it till you, hold on to that until you get to the water station. They got trash cans there. Anyway, I digress. This had more than the idea of physical cleanness, of course. Uh, but God was dwelling among them. And if you're conscious of God's there, you know, you don't do that kind of stuff if you have company in your home. When you have company there, you clean up. But when nobody's there, yeah, you, maybe you throw your stuff all over the place. But, oh, company's coming. Let's pick it up. Let's pick it up. So if you're aware and have a consciousness that God is with you, then that 
is kind of that motivation to not just be neat physically, but to be neat and clean spiritually. Um, the emphasis on this idea of the separation from that which was unclean, physical and spiritual. Israel was to be holy to the Lord. Then they get ready and they get ready to head out to Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh Barnea is where the launching point is for them to go take the land. So we're we're gonna we're gonna head there. They're guided by God in the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire. Um, that that sounding of the trumpets in chapter ten about the organizing the movement. So the, so if you didn't happen to look up and see that something was happening, they would warn you. You'd have a siren, a warning warning bell. Maybe that's what we need in church to get everybody back from the greeting time is a trumpet. <laughs> All right. Uh, and they had they had the war okay, get ready. And then uh, now now line up. Okay, now we're going. Uh, very specific discipline organization in, in getting everybody out, allowing as many as two million people to move in an orderly fashion. It was kind of cool when you stop and think about it. The people who started out first would would obviously get there long before the people behind and they would get things set up and then the temple would, the tabernacle would be set up and then people just kind of fill in around it and then you start setting up your tents and I don't you know, I can't I, what I thought today or yesterday I thought I wonder if they always camp next to the same people you know or you say oh well, let's not camp next to them you know <laughs> We're going to move our camp somewhere else. We've got to try somebody else because this one isn't working. Yeah, the annoying people. The loud family <laughs> that was next door to us in one place. Uh, so th the process, don't know exactly how long it took them to get there, but it took them a little while. And then we get to this rebellion uh, in, in chapter 11. Uh, complaining about manna. Uh, and you know what manna means? The word manna means, what is it? And so that's a good name. We don't know what it is. Uh, but it's it was something that was sweet. It worked like some flour products that they had. They could make bread out of it. They I don't know what, they probably could make soup out of it if they had the Vitamix. You know, they could do that. Uh, they could They could, you know, do all kinds of wonderful things with it. But the reality is it was still manna. And it was, how often were they eating manna? Every day. Now, at this point, what we're saying, maybe a year, over a year, a year and a half, maybe, a year and three months, they're into this. And they're tired of it. They want something else. Um, God began judging them for their grumbling and complaining. Um, there seems... One theory is that it started with the mixed multitude and uh, kind of caught on, caught on fire uh, among the Israelites, and then the fire came and began to judge uh, the people. And so what does Moses do? Moses does what every leader should do. He, should, he prays, intercedes, and asks God for mercy and asks God to deliver them. Uh, and, and then in the midst of that, Moses, Moses has some complaints. Um, did I jump one? Yeah. Yeah. Moses complains about the burden. There you go. So God appoints 70 elders to help with the, the load. Um, Don Lurch, our treasurer extraordinaire, Pastor Don, uh, his favorite Bible character is Moses. He just doesn't understand how Moses could put up with all that. And he says, "I got to ask him when he get, when I get there. How did you do that? Well, we know how he did it. How did how did Moses? How was he able to do this? God's grace. What was he noted for? His humility. And he lived that out. And and prayed and prayed and prayed. He had a couple of problems here and there, but who doesn't? Uh, quail was sent. Uh, the people were plagued because." They ate it raw, or they ate it at least with the blood. If they didn't bleed it all the way, however that worked. I I don't know that I've ever been that hungry. And especially if I've been eating and I've got food in me, and then now, oh, now I get to have something. Now, I guess if cookies had blood in them, I might be in trouble. You know, 
cookies with blood, I, I might be in trouble. I don't think I'd eat it, but still. Um, they just went and they began to do it, and, they ate the, and God brought judgment on them. Um, when God sent the quail, let's go back to that just for a second. Did God send them just a little bit of quail? Like three feet deep. Have you found it true that when God provides for you, he provides abundantly beyond what you really need, beyond what you even ask for? That's what scripture tells us. That's how, that's how our God is. Um, and it wasn't mean-spirited. It was, it was his generosity. Um, if there's one thing that I think as followers of Christ that we, how we should represent God to this world is, is that God is generous. Not, not going over to this side that says God is only interested in giving you wealth and that he wants you wealthy, the name it and claim it idea, that, that that's the whole idea that it's, that God wants you wealthy, so be wealthy and get all that you can. No, God is a generous God, and then we should be generous people, whether we have a lot or whether we have a little. We should be generous people because that's how God is, and that's how we should represent him. Um, just wanted to make sure I got that in. Miriam um, and Aaron have a little bit of a problem, uh, a disagreement about uh, it it comes in the form of Moses's Ethiopian wife now I know some of you are saying Ethiopian I thought he would I thought he was in Midian when he got married and and now he's got an Ethiopian wife what what happened to the Midian wife um, It doesn't say. <laughs> Is it the same woman? Is it possibly the same woman that she was of Ethiopian origin, living in Midian and Jethro? Because his father-in-law has a different name later, and then he's got this other, he's got... So, who knows? It doesn't really matter. But, but Miriam complained about his wife. Um, just as a, a, a heads up and a warning, you know, when we talk about part of our process here is training people for ministry and, and hopefully even getting some village missionaries out of this process uh, like we did with Mark and Karen who were here today. Um, wives sometimes get the flack for, you know, they're upset at the husband, at the pastor, and so they take it out on the wife and they'll complain about the pastor's wife who's supposed to be the... What what was that? First lady. First lady. The first lady, yeah. It's supposed to be the first lady, and, and everything defers to her. Uh, but Miriam was complaining about Moses' wife when she was really upset at her brother. Now, Miriam and Aaron had a little bit of a problem. Let's remember the dynamics here. Who's the youngest in the family? Moses is the youngest. Who's the oldest? Miriam's the oldest, and she's the girl, and she's the mom, and she's the one... And she plays a major role through this whole thing, and she begins to complain. And for some reason, she's the one who gets leprosy. Aaron, who was complaining and part of this griping around, doesn't get leprosy. And I know some of you are thinking, well, wait a minute, that's not fair. Is God unjust? Do we know the whole story? No, we don't know the whole story. If you have an older sister, maybe just if you have a sister, you know how persuasive they can be. And you kind of go along with whatever is going on, and it's not really your idea, but you're kind of in there, and you're caught, and I don't know. There's all sorts of ways you can try to rationalize it. God doesn't tell us what it is, but he does this judgment, and in that judgment, what do we see? We see that God does what is right. And Miriam gets leprosy. And so what does her brother do? Prays for her. Lord, don't let her die. Don't let her go. The, please heal her. And, and he says, okay, I'll heal her. But she still has to follow the rules of leprosy. Uh, back in Leviticus 13, 
You got you got seven days. She's got to stay over there, away from everybody. And so for seven days, she's over there, and everybody's twiddling their thumbs. We are on our way. See, isn't it interesting? We are on our way to conquer the land that God has promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and to us. The covenant God has given it to us. We're going to go get it. And as we're going into this, what comes up? Well, this and this complaining and this griping and the quail thing and, and now Miriam's getting in it and now we've got to hang around for seven days while she gets to this thing of being clean. Um, that's where, by the way, in that whole passage is where Moses is praised for his uh, humility. Uh, the crisis of unbelief. Uh, they get to Kadesh Barnea. Uh, do you know where Kadesh Barnea is? For some reason in my mind, I always had it uh, up near Jerusalem somewhere just across the river. I, because that's where they kind of came in. But um, in, uh, I think it's in this book, in Ben Weir's book, there's a, a little map, or maybe, it, there it is. It's on page 77 in here. And, and it's very easy to miss uh, because it's way down down over here, <laughs> way down over here. I don't think I don't have a map on here, so uh, on the on the slides. Uh, if you see Zoar on your map, uh, it's just below the Dead Sea. Then you got to go southwest uh, all the way over to the corner to where you'll see Kadesh Barnea. So the that's where they came to get ready to launch their attack into the promised land. And so they sent out their spies. Whose idea was it to send out the spies? Look at uh, Numbers chapter 13, verse 1. Numbers chapter 13, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Verse 2, send out for yourself men so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going to give to the sons of Israel. You shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, every one a leader, leader among them. So in Numbers 13, 1 and 2, it's God's idea. We're going to get to Deuteronomy, so let's just jump over there real quick to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Verses 22 and 23. Moses is recounting for this new generation uh, the story of what happened and how we got into this mess. And he says, Then all of you approached me, all of you, all of the people, and said, Let us send men before us that they may search out the land for us and bring back to us word of the way by which we should go up and the cities we shall enter. The thing pleased me, and I took 12 of your men, one man from each tribe. So is that a contradiction in terms? Whose idea was this? Israel's? God's? How, how can we reconcile this? I don't know that we have to fight about it and, and get too caught up about it. Uh, we can see the scenario where this was an idea that the children of Israel had, that people thought was, is it a good idea? There was nothing inherently wrong with this idea, folks. It didn't have a good result. But that wasn't the idea's fault. It was a smart thing to do, to see where they were going to go, to get the lay of the land, to know the approaches, to figure out what cities they had to deal with, to, to see what was there. And, and we can see a scenario where the, the people come to Moses and say, we need to send in some spies before we send in our troops. We've got to see what we're getting into. And Moses was happy with it, brought it to God, as it were, and said, hey, God, people think this is a good idea. I think it's a good idea. What do you think? And God says, good idea. Send them out. I don't think it's a huge, whether God initiates it, or God initiated it with Moses and then the people came at the same time and you had the confirmation. Have you had those things happen? Where you know, the Lord's kind of speaking to you about an idea, something you should do, and, and you're thinking about it and praying about it, and then somebody else over here comes over and says, you know what I think you ought to do? 
And they say the same thing that God had been saying to you, that, you, that oh, well, there's confirmation. It could go either way. Either God had begun the issue with Moses, and then the people came and confirmed it, or the people brought it up, and then God confirmed it. Either way, it, it still works. Um, wasn't wrong. That's an important thing to say. Sometimes we look at, at something bad has happened, and so therefore, because this led to that bad thing, then that thing is now the, the culprit. It was a bad thing to do. When it wasn't a bad thing to do, it was wrong personnel. Well, and it wasn't even wrong personnel. It was believing the things that weren't true that, that came in. So we get the report that comes back. You know the story, right? Oh, look at this. It's uh, about almost four minutes after eight. Yeah. Good thing. Uh, thanks for uh, nobody saw that. I just saw that. Okay. Let's take a five-minute break. Uh, Ten minutes after eight, we'll be back. Sorry about that.
Okay, we're uh, we're back at it. Nathan's working with Pastor Rob on some uh, getting the questions back up there, and and it looks like we we picked up uh, three people. Maybe Dilly. I hope that's still, I, so. Hi, Dilly. Hi, Pastor Pastor Bob. Uh, and we had a fourth person, a fourth person on for a while. So we are at the report. The spies have gone out. They've come back, and um, would you say it was glowing? A glowing report. Um, they described it in terms that seem incredu incredulous, incredible. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, drawings and stuff. And but my grandmother has has had a Bible. I have it now in my possession over at the house. And in the back uh, are pictures. They're kind of a green, grayish tint, and and there are these drawings of biblical scenes. Um, and of course, the guys are always strong and muscular, and and the and the robes are there, and the whole thing, the traditional kind of way of doing things there. But I can remember seeing the picture of when they came back from the Promised Land from Canaan with produce. They brought back some of the produce, and it shows these two guys with this almost a log between them that they're carrying stuff on, and it's got a bunch of grapes on there with grapes the size of watermelons or cantaloupes and I'm thinking you know I at the time I didn't think of it now but I look back I don't think that was really how big they were but it was the idea you know they were they were just gushing about this about how a bun they said that it was a land that flowed with milk and with honey how yeah how does that work Amanda says to get the milk, you got to milk the cow. And somebody's got to milk enough milk to get it to flow down like a creek or a river. And honey doesn't flow very well, no. But it, it's the idea. It's the idea there's an abundance of it. Uh, a land flowing with milk and honey. Uh, now, you, you can imagine uh, this fertile production that's there after what they've been through for the past year and a half. They left Egypt, which had its fertile place, and their home place, which was pretty fertile for the grass, for the, and they come across the Sinai Peninsula down there, which I have not been to, but I think we're going to go to uh, in February. Um, it, I've seen pictures. You wonder, why are you out there? Why is anybody out there? It's deserty and rocky and you know maybe a patch here or there. And then they're coming up to Kadesh and they get in and oh, look at this place. Whoa. It's like the response that people have when they come to Savi Island. That happened twice today. People look just stop and look and say, Wow, this is pretty nice. It is pretty nice. It's a glorious thing. And that's the way it was described. Uh, but their discouraging report was also as glowing and as full of hyperbole. They said, there are giants in the land. Now, when we think of giants because of our cultural training, we think of the giants in the fairy tales and the giants you know, that are the fee-fi-fo-fums and climb the... Uh, yeah. Uh, what they were really talking about was giants similar to what we would see about Goliath later. Guys that were big. Now, you've got to realize in warfare, this is hand-to-hand -hand combat. And so if you're the little guy taking on the big guy, you're kind of at a disadvantage. Uh, they're bigger and stronger. They probably aren't faster. If they were faster, then you're really in trouble. Uh, and how did they describe it? They said, we were like, we were like grasshoppers in their sight. At least that's New American Standard says grasshoppers. We were like grasshoppers in their sight. Well, really? Well, they looked at they looked at us and saw us as grasshoppers. That we, they'll just squish us like a bug. How did how did the people in the land look at Israel? I don't know how they did right then. I do know that when they come back. And they come to Jericho, and they get the spies that go there get hidden. We know, we heard what God did 
in Egypt. And we know what's going to happen here. And the people of the land were terrified of Israel. Uh, so I, there was the discouraging report. Uh, the response was fear and unbelief, except for Joshua and Caleb. They were the two. Ten said nay, two said yay. <laughs> Let's go for this. God can, God can give us this victory. Um, the result was another rebellion. Uh, some uh, guys got together and said, Moses, you've gone far enough. This is, you're done leading us. We're gonna, if you're not going to lead us back to Egypt, we'll lead, our, lead ourselves back to Egypt. And they started organizing to go back to Egypt. And so Moses intercedes again because God is judging them. And then they make a, a great decision. They repent after God says, okay, you guys, now you've done it. Okay, you're not entering the land. I'll give it to your children. They were primarily, they say, they said they were afraid for their children. And so God says, I'm going to take your children in, but you're not going in. And then they said, oh, we're sorry, God, we're sorry. Okay, now we'll go, we'll go. No, 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 I already said you're not going in. Don't go. Oh, no, we're going to go. And so they organized the unit, and they went and they went to attack. And they got routed. And many people died. Now we're going to obey God by disobeying Him again. God says go, we said no. Then God judges us, and they say, okay, now we'll go. And he says, no, 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 I said no, go. So don't go. No, we're going to obey you the first thing. We like the first thing you said better now. We don't want the judgment. Aren't you glad you never do that? Who was going to win this battle for them? Their, their armies or God? Or was God going to use their armies? It's both and, isn't it? God had a plan. God would power, empower them. God would give them the victory. They still had to go do it. And it was messy work, for sure. But it's never about the numbers. Let me say it again. It's never, ever about the numbers. It's not about the size. It's about what God calls us to do. God delights in using the nobodies and the nothings and the weak and the small in order to do great things. Bigger is better. That's our culture. Bigger is not always better. Bigger is not evil. Let's just make sure we get balanced here and don't go off on the deep end and say, oh, all those big churches, they must be compromising and therefore they aren't any good. No, no, no. Big churches do great things. Little churches do great things. Because God does great things. And when God works in a life, whether it's in one life or 50 lives, it's still a great thing. And God was wanting to use them, and they were unwilling to be used. So um, they rebelled. Rebels were placed under a sentence of death. Unbelieving spies were killed by a plague, and they moved on. Uh, chapter 15, more laws are given. Israel is reminded again to be holy. Because God is holy, more instructions about offerings for sin, kind of appropriate. Just so you remember, there is a solution for this sin, because you know that people were feeling pretty bad about this, right? Well, there, there's still a sacrifice for sin. And, and we can fail and we can rue the day that we did what we did, and we pay the consequence, and we end up with not getting what we could have had. Coulda, woulda, shoulda, and we didn't. But can we still be forgiven? Yeah. God can forgive us. We don't get to go in the land. That's not about going to heaven. We don't get to get the blessing that was there. But uh, we can be forgiven. There's a provision for sin. In chapter 16 and 17, we have the rebellion of Korah. Uh, challenge to Moses and Aaron's leadership. Who do you guys think you are? Let me, let me read this. Uh, I think the first three verses of chapter, of chapter 16 here. Um, just to hear the, the tone is, is kind of a, 
an amazing thing. Chapter 16, verses 1, 2, and 3. Now, Korah, the son of Izar, the son of Koath, what did the Koathites do? Yeah, he was tired of carrying that stuff around. We want, he was son of Levi with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, Eliab and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben. So it's not just the Levi, it's Reuben was involved in this here. Uh, they took action. And they rose up before Moses together with some of the sons of Israel. 250 leaders of the congregation chosen the assembly, men of renown. So this is no small coup that's going on here. They assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You have gone far enough. For all the congregation are holy, every one of them. And the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord. Who do you think you are? They were accusing him of lording it over him, of being abusive in his use of power. And, and what did Moses do? Verse 4. Fell on his face, began to intercede, began to seek God. Why was Moses and Aaron, why were they in charge? God put him in charge. Did, did Moses seek that office? <laughs> Moses did just about everything he could to get out of it. And Aaron was just kind of, okay, I guess I'm along for the ride. It wasn't nepotism that made Aaron the priest. God made Aaron the priest. There's a, there's a book. One of the great things in the book of Numbers, there's a, uh, there's a series of lessons about the issue of authority and the consequences of rebellion against authority. We have it throughout the scriptures. There's a very good book if you are interested in studying more about the subject of authority and our submission to it and the consequences for not. It's, called, it's by Watchman Nee, Chinese writer, uh, long dead. Uh, it's called Spiritual Authority. And it comes by great recommendation. Uh, Pastor Rob Dorr is the one who gave me the book because he had to read it as an assignment for a class at Multnomah and had to have somebody else read it and then we would discuss it. Uh, but it was given as an assignment to him by Louis Palau, who was teaching that class. And this is a book that Louis Palau says that he reads every year. It's a really pretty short book. It's called Watchman, Watchman Nee. It's called Spiritual Authority. N E E. I don't think Watchman was his real name. I think that's the name that he kind of took at some point, because there's a Watchman Lee as well that kind of came along at some point. Um, anyway, a lot of good information there about the issue of uh, rebellion. A lot of good lessons here in the book of Numbers. Uh, God immediately judged the rebels. This was, this was where it says, uh, back away, <laughs> back away, clear the area. Uh, it, it, yeah, run away unless you are. If you're a part of the group, stay there. This is the thing they ought to do for movies, right? Yeah. Biblical movie. Whoa, the ground opens up and swallows them, and and it does, it's not just one of those chasms that then it closes back up over them. Yeah, boy. Then the 250 leaders are destroyed by fire and people are still rebellious, so God begins judgment. Still, after this, people are in rebellion. Uh, part of this, part of that, see, the, the danger that we get into is when we buy into rebellion, even to a little bit, when we begin to, to not submit to proper authorities and we begin that little bit of rebellion, it opens up all kinds of trouble for us. Uh, later on, we're going to see it in, in Samuel. Uh, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Uh, insubordination is, I forget the, the, the second part of it. When we get involved in rebellion, in defying authority, in not being properly submissive when we should be, we expose ourselves directly to the realm of Satan. We put ourselves in that, in that dangerous place. And, and how could they continue in this rebellion and, and this deal with what had just happened? Well, they did. And Aaron and Moses interceded for them. Um, important to know. By the way, you need to know that Kadesh Barnea was the place of testing 
for your quiz, just so you're aware of that. It was the place where they failed. It was um, important. So then we skip these years that we don't have a whole lot of information about. We have some. Uh, by the way, in your, I think I have it later in in the notes. Uh, on page 23 of Benware, is it 23? There's a chart. No, it can't be 23. Yeah, it's in, it's in the 73. That's what it is. 73. It, it, there's a chart. Israel's complaints in the wilderness. Uh, you may not have access to this, but I can get you a copy of it if you want. It's it's kind of, it goes through uh, Exodus, 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 Numbers, 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 and lists all of the complaints that they had. That Israel, when they Israel murmured, I don't know if I told you one of my one of my teachers at uh, at Prairie, he he taught Hebrew history, which was kind of a part of this what we're doing here. And uh, one of his favorite lines was, uh, "And the children of Israel murmured." And the children of Israel, they did it a lot. And there's a chart that kind of gives you all the breakdown of it, um, complaining about God's provision or that God hasn't given it to them yet. Um, so after years of discipline were over, God brings Israel back to the place where their failure began. And so they, they, there's a little map, I think, in, in uh, Nelson's book. And it, it shows, it's kind of interesting, it shows, uh, it shows them coming up out of the the Sinai Peninsula and they come to Kadesh and then then they're just kind of there's a circle and it says they kind of wandered around in this area for all that time and then then they started heading back up when they got time after it was over uh, have no idea where they went how long they stayed at any place it says sometimes it was a short time sometimes it was a long time uh, but it was at God's direction um, so discipline was over there come back to the place of their failure. By the way, that's kind of an interesting little, I don't know that it's an absolute principle, but I think it's a pretty solid one. I, I've seen it over and over again. You will, if you haven't already experienced this, if you maybe you haven't had a failure, um, God calls you, God wants you to do something, he's leading you this way, and you go and you go and you get to one spot and you stop. And for whatever reason, you decide, I'm not going to follow anymore. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do what you want, God. I'm going to go this way instead. Invariably, in order for you to get back on track, you, you may go years and, oh, well, I'll go try to serve God here and do this. No, 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 no. God's not, God's not sending you there. God is pretty persistent. Here. Like Cosby used to say to his kids, come here. Right here is where we're dealing with this. And so as they wandered around, where did they end up? Right back to where they failed. Because they had to deal with that. And I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in a host of other lives. People who, who were going along and they, they balked and they went off course and they had to come back to that place. Sometimes you don't get to come back and a couple of guys I knew that were supposed to be pastors. They felt God's call to be a pastor, and they got to that point, and everything was ready, and then they bailed. And honestly, they became problems to people in the churches. And they had, I don't know that they were ever going to be a pastor, but they had to come back to that point and deal with that issue with God. And so God brings Israel back to Kadesh, and God will bring you back to wherever it is that you've jumped off, or balked at following, refused to do. Again, you may not have the same opportunity that you had before, but you still have to get it dealt with. So that's my little soapbox on Kadesh. Uh, they come back to the place where they failed. Miriam and Aaron die. Um, Eleazar is the new high priest. It's kind of an interesting little <laughs> scenario there. Um, they start taking off Aaron's robes and putting them on his son and Next thing you know, Aaron lays down and dies. And, you know, it'd be a strange event. I mean, how, you know, okay, I'm taking off my clothes, and you know, you know, it's coming. And I don't know if it's a heart attack or just went to sleep and was dead. I don't. It doesn't say. But anyway, interesting little. You got to use a little bit of imagination as you read and picture the things as really happening because they really happened. 
But then right after that, there was another rebellion. Now, let's give them a little bit of credit here because they were out of water. And they began to complain because they didn't have water. Now, what had been their experience up to this point? For 38 years at least, or 40 years, had they ever died of thirst? Not once. Now, I don't know, maybe some of the older ones that were dying off as they were wandering around waiting for everybody to die. I don't know if they got thirsty and died. But they had always had water. And they were getting, either they were low or they were out. There's no water. We need water. And of course, the way you get water is to complain. Rather than ask Moses, rather than ask God, they begin to complain. You've led us out here. You, Moses, have done this. God has done this. Brought us out here to kill us. That's exactly what God does, doesn't it? Well, he was killing a bunch of those people in the wilderness, wasn't he? But it wasn't the ones that were complaining. These people were complaining because they didn't have water. And then we have the, the great tragedy of Moses' presumptive actions. Uh, earlier, they had been out of water and had complained. And God said to Moses, Moses, uh, go to this rock, take your staff and strike it. And water will gush forth. And he did. Water came forth. Very significant event. We read about it in the New Testament. Where it says the rock that followed the children of Israel in the wilderness was Christ. And so when the rock was struck, I was trying to reach into my pocket and get my rock out of here. That's why I have this rock in my pocket. This represents the idea when my, when my grandmother died. I probably told you all this story. My grandmother died. I was back in Granite visiting. I was there for the funeral and wandering around town looking at all the houses where they lived and and went to the quarry where my granddad worked at the granite quarry. And um, I picked up some granite and I was walking back toward the church and and the verse came to my mind. The rock that followed them was Christ. So here I am kind of thinking back to my history and my life. I lived with my grandparents for four years and the significant things and how significant they were in my life. And it said the rock that followed them was Christ. Now you may think that, well, that's not very significant or that's not very enlightening. In an instant, in an instant, you know, the life flashes before. I saw everything that God had done using other people to show me that he was there to care for me, that he followed me all the days of my life, that the rock that had followed me was Christ. And he followed me and my grandparents, and he followed me and my parents, my mom, and, and even in my father, <laughs> uh, and, and in my dad, and in Sunday school teachers, and the friends of my parents, the parents of my friends. I, I saw all these, my aunts and my uncles. It was just almost overwhelming. And so I went back and got some more rocks to give to the kids and, and to the, my sisters. And then a guy polished this up for me. But I carried around. This is my Ebenezer. We'll get to Ebenezer later. This is my memory stone. It's not my idol. It's not my lucky thing. It's the thing to remind me that the rock that followed me was Christ. That Jesus Christ has followed me, waiting for me to turn around to him all of the days of my life. He provided. He protected. He cared for me. And, and as even though I'm following him, he's following me. Um, so there's that picture. Jesus Christ is struck to provide living water. And we got that thing in John 4 with the woman at the well. If you knew, you would ask him and he'd give you water, living water. So now we come. There's another need for water. And God tells Moses this time, Moses, speak to the rock. And he goes to the rock and he is kind of upset at everybody, sped up with this rebellion, and he strikes it twice. And water comes out. And then God judges Moses by not allowing him into the land. Pretty severe judgment for one little disobedience. But what was the problem was that he messed up the picture. The picture of Christ. How many times does Jesus need to be struck? Once. Once for all, he died for us. Now you want salvation? Just ask. They were denied passage through Edom, and so they went around uh, through Moab, 
on the way to Moab. They defeated. They had some warfare going along the way. Um, there was this one quick thing about the 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 rebellion, the the sin that went on there, the serpent rebellion, we call it, uh, and and people were getting bit by serpents and dying and uh, again, Mo Moses intercedes, and they come up with this weird remedy. They take a pole, and they take a, a bronze serpent, sort of like what we see on a medical insignia, and they held it up. And anyone who looked to that bronze serpent on the pole would live. And that's how they survived. Well, was this an idol? Was this some sort of magic charm? What's the representation of that serpent? Sin. Uh, we come to the New Testament, we find out that he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God. And if we look to him in faith, we too are healed. There's a, a great deal there. The Balaam incident comes up. We've we got some wars that went on there. Um, Balaam, uh, prophet, a Gentile, um, offered a lot of money to come and to curse Israel. And he refuses, and they offer him more money. And he says, okay, God, can I go? And more money. And so finally he goes. And he says, well, I can only tell you, I can only do what God tells me. And so he blesses them. And, of course, the king that hired him is very upset. And, and so he says, well, look, let me give you some counsel. Get your girls to marry their guys. And then you can turn their hearts towards your idols, and they'll violate God's laws, and then God will have to judge them. And you won't even have to do anything. And so they do. Um, so that whole tragic thing is there. Um, a new census. So we'll just kind of skip ahead here to the new census. Uh, there we go. Um, getting ready now to go in the land. So what do they do? Let's get a count again. How many guys we got? Uh, they counted. They got 601,730. I forget what the number was earlier. 6,000. 700, 6,003, yeah, 1,500 or 2,000, something like that, different. A um, few thousand left in the last census. But again, it's not about the numbers. The reality is they were going in and they were going to take on basically a city-state at a time. And, a, and how many people were going to be, how many soldiers were they going to be mustering out of those city-states? So that really wasn't part of the point to begin with. Um, by the way, just a quick note about Balaam. I have it there. God uses Balaam to prophesy about the coming Messiah um, in, in Numbers 24, uh, verse 17 especially. Um, we get prepared for the conquest. They get ready to enter the land. Uh, Joshua is selected to replace Moses. Uh, Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh, that's supposed to be an A in there, uh, granted permission to settle on the other side. Um, but they have to Make sure they help everybody else get their own land first. Uh, there's here's some there's one of the maps. I knew I did have some maps here somewhere. The wilderness of sin and where they that red line and it's probably in the Nelson's book. I think is that map. Um, Kadesh Barnea, Edom, and Moab. They're heading up that side now. Shoot, I like that. Um, Reuben, Gad, Manasseh on this side of the of the line. Points of interest here in Numbers. Uh, Aaron's benediction in 622 and 27 to 27. Uh, the chart on page 73 I mentioned, Israel's failure at Kadesh. Uh, learn, learn, learn that lesson. And the waters of Meribah. Uh, the R is misplaced there, extra R. Uh, Deuteronomy. 20 minutes for Deuteronomy. <laughs> That's okay. Deuteronomy, it, 20 minutes we're going to be in good shape. Uh, it, it's a repeat. We're going back over. It's it's a re re rehash of the other. Not that it's uh, not worthwhile, but a lot of this stuff we were able to already be aware of. Um, instructions to a new generation. The second giving of the law is, the, is really what it's about. Deuter to the Deuteronomy, the law. Uh, written by Moses around 1405. Somewhere this is towards the end of his life. Uh, reminding Israel of their special relationship to God. Oh, I, need to, I didn't move that, did I? There we go. Um, they're the covenant people. They need to obey God's law. Uh, they're to have a good testimony to the nations. Let's make sure we understand. It was never the plan that Israel was just to be a blessing for themselves. 
What did God say to Abraham? Through you, I will bless all the families of the earth. And so it wasn't just about Israel being blessed. It was about Israel being a blessing to the nations and not just in providing education or information, those things, but by providing the information about the one true God, to bring the one true God to the people. Uh, and there's warnings of judgment and diso for their disobedience. Uh, Deuteronomy in the Caesarean, 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 there you go, Caesarean. I, I looked at it and it took me a minute. Um, I gave you a bunch of notes toward from, from here on, kind of going over this treaty. That This was a, a, a thing, uh, some documents that they found among the Hittite ruins, uh, where it was a pattern for establishing a covenant. And this... Uh, this area here, the preamble, the historical prologue, the stipulations, the deposit, and the reading of the covenant, the witnesses, the curses, and blessings. That was the pattern that, was, that the Hittites used in establishing a covenant. Um, the idea was that the, uh, the, the, the head guy, the big dog, uh, the leader of this, the suzerain, let me say it again, yeah. suzerain, okay, I, that was right. Yeah, there you go. Uh, they were the one who initiated the covenant. And then you had the underling that would respond and the vassal, there you go. And uh, there was documents that were written and they got stored in the holy place. It, it, it sounds a lot like what we went through in the book of Exodus. And it sounds like everything that's being recounted here in the book of Deuteronomy. The significant thing is it's from the same time period, the Hittites when they found this. Now, we'll cut to the chase and find out, was, was this... See, some would say, well, Israel was just... You know, Moses was just copying the, the Hittites in doing this. And so he just made it up because the Hittites already had this pattern. And so he was making all this up about God and he was the vassal. Moses was the vassal and Israel was supposed to be the vassal there. Um, which came first? Did the Hittites have this as part of their culture? And so God, and, and let's, let's take it out of hands of Moses, let's, let's give God the credit and say, well, God accommodated himself to the culture around that area and to something that everybody would kind of understand by establishing this covenant in this way. Or is it more likely that the covenant God who was the first one to establish covenant with Abraham, what with Adam, and with Noah, and on and on and on, that the covenant-making God is the one who established that pattern, and the Hittites, at least traced back to Noah, would know about that pattern, would know about, here's, how, here's the formula for making the covenant promise. When we, when we have those wedding ceremonies, it's a covenant-making ceremony, and a lot of those things in that ceremony are reflected in the biblical mandate of making covenants. Uh, you have the sacrifice image there. You have the people walking down the middle aisle. You've got the dress. You've got the whole shebang. There's a lot of things that are, are put into that. I think it's probably more that, that God had established this pattern, and that pattern you find in other cultures. Uh, there's, a, there's a really neat study that uh, Don Richardson has done on God's keys to man's cultures in missionary work. And I, I won't get into the storytelling here now, but, but the idea that God has planted within every culture significant things that they believe, things they do that mirror or picture or reflect salvation through Jesus Christ. The way for us to come to know God. And, and most missionaries, even to these tribal people, when they go in, they find if they take the time and learn about their culture and learn about the language and all of those things, and they start telling, then they start seeing, wait a minute, there's, they, they can understand it because God put it in their culture, and so now I can take this account and tell them about how God had provided salvation, and they'll get it because it's there. And I think that that's how this whole... Caesarean thing came came about that God had put that in the cultures. Caesarean, Caesarean, no, suzerain, not 
Suzerian. Suzerain. See, it's the A-I-N that throws me. It should be rain. Yeah, okay. Let, let's let I'll let you go through and and read uh, read about all of those things. Um, let's let's go to page nine in our notes. Uh, it, it I put some extra stuff in the very back of your notes as well as a a blow by blow as we kind of walk through that other. So uh, Moses reviews. Um, oh, I went too far. There we go. Moses reviews the journey from Sinai to the plains of Moab. Um, let's just, let's just kind of get everybody on the same page, make sure we realize why we're here and how we got here. Uh, recounting God's great faithfulness, his great power, all of the things that God had... You would think they would remember that, right? Well, you remember everything that God's done for you, don't you? You remember all those things. It's right there at, at a, in a moment's notice. I didn't remember all those things that God had done for me. I wasn't even aware that God had done all those things for me until that moment that I realized it, that God brought it to my memory. It's easy for us to forget God's power, especially when we're surrounded by the dogs and the oxen and the lions and we're in trouble. We forget what God has done in the past. So he's going back and, and going through that. He's also reminding them making sure they remember their unbelief and their failure. Oh man, that's just a bummer. I don't want to remember my failures. I only want to remember the good things. But we've got to remember the failures as well. What's the advantage of remembering your failures? Hopefully, we won't do it again. That would be one of them. I don't want to do that. I tried that. It didn't work. Uh... Well, maybe it'll work this time, though, because I'm older and I'm wiser now. I'm stronger or whatever. Hopefully we'll learn that. What else would be a good reason for us to remember, uh, as David would say, the pit from which we were dug? Keeps us humble. That's, that's exactly it. We don't get too full of ourselves. You know, we, we, we start, you know, they're getting ready to go in and win and win and win and take over things and inherit things that they never even worked for. And it's easy to start feeling privileged that we somehow deserve this and that somehow God owes it to us or those people owe it to us. And if we remember where we came from, if we remember our failures, if we remember uh, our unbelief or even the unbelief of our parents, um, that's an important thing for us because sometimes if we think that we, when we build our foundation on things that aren't really true, we get in trouble. Uh, we see it a lot when, when people die. People die and, and suddenly they were, the, they were just such the kindest, nicest person you'd ever want to know. Uh, Mark and Karen had that happen recently and they were this glowing testimonial in the, edit, in the obituary and they were reading, oh, that must have been a nice guy and everybody there said, oh, he was a creep. He was the worst person you'd ever want to know. Uh, we forget. Okay, let's, let's deal with reality is what we need to deal with. And reality is that we have failed in the past. Now, can we get out of balance either way? We can get out of balance by remembering all our successes and failures and forgetting about that. Can we get out of balance with all of our failures and our sins? Yeah. And we can just beat ourselves down and say, oh, I can't do it. And I'm, I'm, I can't do this. I've always failed. I, can, I don't. Well, no, you can't. But God can through you. Knock it off. You know. Get some balance in it. Has God done this? Yes. Have you failed? Yes. Has he forgiven you? Yes. Has he used you? Yes. Okay. Then keep it all in, in right order. Um, God's provision and his protection. And the way to blessing is through obedience. The safe way. Um, he reviews the, the and, and expands on the law. Uh, significant there in, in Deuteronomy 6 that parents are seen as essential in communicating the law to the next generation. Let's, let's make it loud and clear. Yes, the church 
is responsible to make disciples, and it's a good thing for us to have children's ministries and youth ministries and adult ministries and all of those things, but it's not to the exclusion, and it's not to the place to where the parents can say, oh, I'll just send them to the church and have the church do it. That's not God's plan. God's plan is for the parents to teach the children about who God is, live it out in their daily life. Uh, they're in Deuteronomy 6. How are, where are they supposed to talk about the things of God and God's laws and God's commands and God's work? All the time. When you get up in the morning, when you rise up, and when you are walking along the way, and when you sit down, and when you go to bed, Basically, any time is a good time to talk about God and about God's Word and about God's ways. It doesn't mean that that's the only thing you talk about, but it becomes a part of what you talk about because that's the way the children, the best way for children to learn it, at least initially and, and at least to whatever degree. Now, can we do at times have classes and Sunday school classes and Olympian club to where things are geared for the children in a group and we can be thorough and train and teach as well as you know outside the family? Oh, sure. It's not either or, it's both and. And, and some of our discussion today in our sharing as village missionaries was the, the great concern for the lack of concern in, um, in the current generation for their children's spiritual well-being. Uh, the things we heard from the kids at camp were consistent. I've got to believe in something. I can't believe it was just, it just all happened by accident. I've got to believe in something. And yet, from above, from their parents' level, the parents aren't the ones believing in something. They're the one buying into the idea that, oh, live your life and have fun and make money and be successful and learn all you can. And the kids are saying, no, I need something more. Uh, Casey was echoing that at Yale, that the, the kids are hungry for, they want to know truth. They know the stuff that they're being told is not true, and they want something real. So, so we need to be praying, not just for those kids for, to come over for Olympian Club. We need to be praying for parents to have a heart to know God and, and have a responsibility for their children in that. Um, there's this issue of the relationship with the Canaanites. Uh, one of the things that gets misunderstood is G Israel wasn't going into the land and killing every single person in the land. They were killing the Canaanites. In fact, some of the Canaanites didn't even get killed by God's sovereign grace of their response and his rescue of them. He spared some of them. Some of the Canaanites didn't get killed because Israel was disobedient and didn't finish the job. But that was the command. Who were they not supposed to marry? Canaanites. It wasn't a prohibition against marrying others who weren't Jews. It was a prohibition against marrying the Canaanites. It was a prohibition against letting the Canaanites stay and be slaves. You could do that with others, but not with them. So it's not this blanket across the board where, where Israel was there to wipe out every people group they were to take the cities and then eventually secure the land, not necessarily wipe out everybody. The other people could leave. They could become the mixed multitude that was with them there. Um, I, I think we need to understand that. The other factor is that we often wonder, well, why would God do that? Well, how bad do you think it was? If God is going to judge a people group that way, we see it back at the flood when God judged the whole world. It was pretty bad, and we don't, we don't get the full brunt of it, but because we know who God is and we believe that he is righteous and just, we believe he is gracious and merciful, and if he is going to do something this drastic, is he justified in that, do you think? We're going to give him the benefit of the doubt? See, either we give God the benefit of the doubt or we accuse him of being unjust in bringing this about. And I think we need to give him the benefit of the doubt because he is just. He has proven himself so. Um, no relationship with him was the plan. Uh, we won't get into the... One of the reasons I think that Israel had trouble 
finishing the job was because it was messy. You know, it was it was not a pleasant thing to kill people by the edge of the sword. It was long, it was arduous, it was bloody, it was messy, and you start throwing in animals and children and and all of that. It's just it's not a pleasant thing. I've never killed somebody. Don't know that I want to, uh, but you can imagine the the toll that it would take. Um, there was the mention of the unique character of the land, reminding them that they were totally dependent on the rain, and the rain was going to come from God and God's blessing. Obedience would bring blessing and rain, disobedience, drought, and famine, and it proved out that way again and again. Um, reviewed the covenant relationship. Uh, the covenant at Mount Sinai was conditional. Uh, in that part of it, it was unconditional in its connection with Abraham. Uh, blessings associated on Mount Gerizim and uh, curses associated on Mount Ebal. Just like we saw in the book of Leviticus, there was this cursing and the blessing. If you do this, here's your blessing. If you don't, here's the curse. And, and I think there's, uh, if it's not as clear as it was in Leviticus, it's still there in, in the book of Deuteronomy and the blessings and cursings that, that God's ready to forgive. God's ready to restore if you'll respond and repent, if you'll come back to him. Um, the essence of this covenant is that it's embedded in the conditional, unconditional covenant of Abraham. Um, the, the conditional covenant is embedded in the Abraham's unconditional covenant. And we see that in Romans 10. Um, Romans 19 and 11 are a summary of much of this in the New Testament. Then Moses' final ministry. I, I want to read just this last part uh, here at the end of chapter 34 uh, to summarize Moses' ministry. His, his, we see his death. Let's get down to that. Um, finish writing the Pentateuch. There we go. Uh, chapter 34. Uh, of Deuteronomy. We skipped over a lot, but it was, it, like I said, it was basically the rehash of, of Exodus with some expansion here and there and some explanation. Um, starting at verse 5, Moses is dead, and now Joshua is finishing up the writing of this. Uh, writing it up, he says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no man knows his burial place to this day. Although Moses was 120 years old when he died, his eye was not dim nor his vigor abated. So the sons of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning of Moses came to an end. Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. And the sons of Israel listened to him and, he, and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. Since that time... No prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, for all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh, all his servants, and all his land, and for all the mighty power and for all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. Israel ended, I mean, Moses ended his life with this failure and not being able to go in the land. And yet the summary of his life says, look at all that Moses did. God is not unjust to forget our work and our service for him and his kingdom. Even though he's the one who planned it and he's the one who gives us energy and strength and ability to do it, then he turns around and rewards us for it. Hebrews tells us that God is not unjust. He will not forget your labor. Moses' labor, his faithfulness was not forgotten by the failure. And no, mo no prophet has risen since then except... Jesus, who was the one who would come like and be like Moses. So that's Numbers, and that's Deuteronomy. So Thursday, I'll give you a test to take home. We'll talk a little bit more about it then. Um, we'll start with Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. Three books this next time. Um, yeah. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the testimony we see in your word that there is provision for our sin and our failure. Thank you for what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf, that we have 
the satisfaction for our sins. And Lord, I thank you that we have the record that, that when you are writing this, when you're inspiring this uh, recount of Moses' life, yeah, Moses committed murder. Yeah, Moses failed here and Moses failed there and he didn't get into the promised land. But Lord, you summarize his life with those things that are good, those things that are faithful. Lord, because of your graciousness, you choose not to remember our sins against us. And you are just as well as the one who justifies the sinner. So Lord, may we take hope, may we take encouragement, May we be faithful in serving you and your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.